Every now and then, a truly stellar new technology emerges, and it always takes us to places we've never imagined. We saw this with the combustion engine, the telephone, computers, and of course, the internet. And now, another of these breakthroughs is about to boldly transform us, and that is blockchain technology. Just imagine a software engineer in Tanzania working for a company in Canada. The company's payments are first placed in escrow by a blockchain resident smart contract. Quite simply, a contract that can be read and executed by machines. Once our software engineer submits their final product, this smart contract gets to work. Given agreed inputs, does it produce the required outputs? Is it bite-sized enough for consumer-friendly download? Was it delivered on time? Only upon the passing of these machine-run tests does the smart contract itself release payment to the engineer's digital wallet. And our software engineer doesn't even have a bank account. Neither party can game this system because the smart contract's pre-agreed terms are now incorruptible by humans. The software engineer is empowered to participate in the global economy in a fair and frictionless way, while the company has unearthed entirely new ways of doing business, sourcing new suppliers and automating quality assurance. And neither party is subjected to the layers of fees that we typically associate with cross-border payments, so they both improve their margins. Imagine your son or daughter rocking up to a nightclub and proving their eligibility to enter simply by using their thumbprint and a mobile device, without disclosing their date of birth or any personally identifying information, reclaiming complete control over their identity. Imagine a world where assets are tracked from their origin all the way through a supply chain, certifying provenance in irrefutable ways. So a manufacturer can demonstrate that the minerals comprising the panels it fits to a commercial airliner were certified as high grade, and that they were procured from a supplier with an impeccable safety record that also respects human rights. Perhaps we could out slavery enough and so publicly expose those who prosper from it that we can truly affect consumer purchasing behavior. And how good is that? But understanding how we get there really is best understood by first understanding how we arrived here. For thousands of years, we simply wrote things down or etched them in stone. Many of us here can likely still remember bank tellers penning entries in their passbooks not that long ago. But the 20th century's explosion in computing power has created an explosion in the digitization of data and processing, with much of this now residing within the digital walled gardens of large organizations. For a while, this worked pretty well. Computers started printing entries in passbooks and by removing people from the process, we tuned into the benefits of automation and self-service. But things became far more complex very quickly with the introduction of new channels, like contact centers, ATMs, voice recognition services. The problem was that these systems didn't come ready integrated. And so we witnessed another explosion in data silos within organizations leading to data inconsistencies, a whole lot of service issues, and ultimately fraud. So point-to-point -point periodic data transfers between these silos were soon superseded by database replication, where a centralized brain ensured that all changes to all data were synchronized globally within milliseconds. But this was now a world 
where large collections of data and processing could deliver disproportionate returns in the blink of an eye. So if a government defaulted on its bonds, these could be dumped almost instantaneously, globally, across every portfolio holding. And before just about every individual investor ever learned that a default had occurred. But it's not just the banks. Telcos, internet search providers, and now social networks. Virtually every large organization on the planet now has assets just like these. Another side effect of these concentrations of power is that you and I are increasingly reliant upon these walled gardeners to interact with one another in virtually every digital way, to exchange money, emails, photographs, posts, leaving us with little practical option but to trust these intermediaries. But scepticism in organizations' competencies and motivations is at an all-time high. Subprime, Panama, data breaches, data surveillance. It's little wonder that trickle-down trust just isn't cutting it. Walled gardens are closed, but blockchains are open. So what if we tore down some walls, decentralized things, and evolved a new way to exist? You see, blockchains are ultimately about bringing the world closer together, breaking down barriers to entry, commoditizing trust just as the internet commoditized communications. Interoperability is built in from the ground up creating an entirely new layer of interaction for the whole world. So people with no particular knowledge of one another can interact with confidence and without relying upon a trusted third party to do so. So how does a blockchain do this? Well, in real life, elements of human frailty infect our ability to honor agreements. A blockchain uses vast networks of independent computers that verify one another's actions by consensus. And if public enough, with enough participants, a blockchain is extraordinarily secure and virtually impenetrable, indestructible also. And with the data and logic inside a blockchain universally shared, we also gain complete transparency. And this is a very big deal. We can store money, tokens, assets of all kinds inside a blockchain and use them. It allows for an economy between machines, a settlement layer for asset transfers, and all kinds of things we haven't even begun to imagine. Blockchain may soon underpin the next real revolution of the information age. But while the potential benefits of blockchain are undoubtedly immense, in the short to medium term, there will be some maturing and possibly some pain. Current implementations of blockchain, Bitcoin and Ethereum, do not quite meet the performance and scale requirements of some of the applications we've been talking about. The thing is that the computer science of consensus platforms is not yet fully understood. And it will take further research and some trial and error to get there. But that trial and error is a little scary because there is already substantial value at risk. Blockchain technology has a steep learning curve and the applications that run on it will take some time to develop let alone the fact that we're talking about rewiring organizations that support tens of thousands of jobs in departments and divisions, some of which won't be required. That's a huge task. This technology forces entirely new ways of interacting and doing business. In order to shape this future, you need to participate. Those organizations 
that learn how to play in more open and collaborative ecosystems will survive and thrive. Those that don't probably won't. This is a period in technological history during which you cannot stick your head in the sand. Blockchain is real, it's happening. And as the world tunes into it, the prospect for so many to gain access to so much will just be too big and too meaningful for them not to use it. The world is shifting from closed to open systems. There has never been a more promising and direct linkage between technology, economic growth and societal well-being. Everybody can win. It might just be our values that determine who we all really are and what kind of world we leave to future generations. And how good is it that blockchain can encode these values and arbitrate on their behalf? This is something that you and we can make happen and prosper from all together. Are you a maker or a taker? Are you with the open or the closed? I say, we all boldly transform together. Thank you.